Hi, my name is Brianna Sanger, and I'm the Nursing Staff Development Coordinator at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And I will be presenting today on an introduction to cancer. Okay, so let's start with the biology of cancer. Cancer is a collection of over 200 malignant diseases characterized by a series of cellular changes in which our cells divide uncontrollably and start to invade surrounding tissues. This tends to arise from the accumulation of multiple genetic alterations, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. The term carcinogenesis is the process by which normal cells are transformed into cancer cells. Several factors interact to cause carcinogenesis to happen. These may be genetic, environmental, or personal or lifestyle factors. Essentially, no two diagnoses or cases of cancer are exactly the same. For example, two people can have the same environmental exposure risk, such as the same level of sun exposure throughout their lifetime, but their unique genetics may make it so that one of them develops skin cancer and the other one does not. In order to understand how cancer cells behave, it's important to understand how normal cells in our body behave. Normal cells grow when they get a signal from our body telling them it's time to grow. And they tend to grow in a very orderly fashion. One cell becomes two, and then two cells become four, four cells become eight, and so on. Normal cells also stop growing when they meet up with other cells or when they get a signal from our body telling them it's time to stop growing. Normal cells also do not move around the body. Our heart cells stay in our heart, our lung cells stay in our lung, our brain cells stay in our brain, etc. And normal cells know to self-destruct if they become damaged or abnormal in some way. This is called apoptosis. However, malignant cells or cancer cells behave very differently. They grow without any kind of normal go signal from our body, and they don't grow in that orderly fashion. They also don't respond to normal stop signals from our body. They don't self-destruct if they become damaged or abnormal. They just keep growing uncontrollably. And eventually, malignant cells will create their own circulatory system to supply nutrients. This is called angiogenesis. Malignant or cancer cells also often produce higher amounts of specific proteins or display detectable genetic changes known as tumor markers that are not present in normal cells. Genes are inherited instructions that live within a person's cells. Each gene instructs a cell how to build a specific product, in most cases a particular kind of protein. Essentially, they tell our cells what to do and how to behave but damage to our cells can cause genetic mutations or alterations. So how do cells get damaged? The genes in our cells can get damaged four different ways, by chemicals, such as through something like tobacco, um, by radiation, such as through ultraviolet light or UV sun exposure, through different kinds of viruses, or through inherited mutations. Chemicals and radiation act by damaging our genes directly while viruses introduce their own genes into our cells that cause damage and change our cells' ability to function. Inherited mutations are hereditary, which means they are passed on from parent to child through the genes in the sperm and egg cells. Inherited mutations are rare, and they tend to be present most often with very rare cancers or very early onset cancers, roughly five to 10% of all cancer diagnoses. So most cell damage happens from either chemicals, radiation, or viruses. All cancer is genetic in the sense that it is triggered by these altered or damaged genes. Genes that control the normal functions of our cells become damaged in the ways we just talked about. And this is what allows our cells to behave uncontrollably, such as growing without any kind of restraint or avoiding that self-destruction when they become damaged. When we talk about the formation of malignant cells or cancer cells, it usually arises from one single cell. And that cell's process from normal to cancer appears to involve several rounds of mutations before 
uh, a clinically diagnosable cancer can be detected. A carcinogen is any substance that causes cancer. These may be chemical, such as asbestos, arsenic, benzene, uh, chemicals found in tobacco products. They may be environmental, such as uh, things found in pollution or through ultraviolet light or radon gas, or they may be certain kinds of viruses. Here are some examples of chemical and environmental carcinogens. Uh, tobacco contains several different types of carcinogenic uh, chemicals that have been linked to many cancers, most notably lung cancer. Alcohol has been linked to esophagus cancer. Industrial carcinogens such as benzene, soot, tar, oil, or radon have been linked to several different types of cancers. And certain drugs have also been found to cause cancer or been linked to certain cancers, such as diethylstilbestrol with vagina cancer or high doses of estrogen with breast and uterus cancer. Certain viruses have also been associated with certain types of cancer diagnoses. The Epstein-Barr virus, uh, which is the virus responsible for causing mono, um, has been associated with a type of lymphoma called Burkitt's lymphoma. The human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, can cause Kaposi's sarcoma. Hepatitis B has been linked to hepatocellular carcinoma, or liver cancer. And the human papillomavirus, or HPV, has been linked to several types of cancers, most notably cervical cancer. So our cancer risk tends to increase with age, and this is because the risk from exposure to these different types of carcinogens tends to be cumulative. Uh, there is a, a lag time from exposure to a carcinogen to the development of a cancer. Um, but as we age and as we um, go on in life, the more exposures we have to carcinogens, the more likely we are to develop cancer from those carcinogens. Uh, you can see in this graph here, this is a graph of the newly, number of newly diagnosed cases of colon cancer in women in England and Wales over a year. And you can see that as the age of the participants increase to 60, 70, 80 years of age, their risk of developing cancer greatly increases as well. And it's estimated that it takes around six to seven mutations needed for a clinically recognized cancer. So there's, that's where that lag time from exposure can come into play. So now we'll talk a little bit about cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. Many cancers may have some early warning signs that a cancer is growing or that is developing. This may be the first hint to either the patient or their provider that something is not quite right, and it may lead the provider to pursue a diagnosis. Uh, early warning signs can come in many forms and can be very dependent on the type of cancer. Um, but some common ones might be fever, weight loss, or new unexplained pain. So who diagnoses cancer? An oncologist is a doctor who has special training in diagnosing and treating cancer. Some oncologists even specialize in a particular type of cancer treatment or disease, such as a hematologist oncologist who specializes in treating cancers that originate in the blood and marrow. And then a pathologist is a doctor who has special training in identifying diseases by studying cells and tissues under a microscope. So oftentimes to get a cancer diagnosis, both an oncologist and a pathologist will play important roles. There are several different diagnostic tests that can be used to diagnose cancer depending on the type of cancer that it is. Um, there are lab tests such as looking at blood, urine, or other body fluids. These can detect the presence of abnormal lab results or different tumor markers. Um, so maybe a, an abnormally high level of white blood cells found in a blood sample or a certain type of tumor marker that's been identified. There are imaging tests such as a CT, MRI, X-ray, ultrasound, PET scan, or others. These look at different parts of the body and help to confirm whether a tumor is present and try to distinguish it from a benign mass or a non-cancerous mass. And then there's a biopsy, which is removal and examination of tissue under a microscope 
to determine whether the cells in that tissue are cancerous or not. Uh, so oftentimes you will see a combination of these different diagnose, diagnostic tests in order to diagnose cancer. So once a cancer diagnosis has been obtained, it's important to classify the cancer. And we'll talk more about what this means in a couple slides. Uh, but this is important because it provides prognostic information for the patient and the provider. It helps the provider plan treatment that will be most effective in treating and hopefully curing the cancer. It helps to evaluate how well the treatment is working. It facilitates the exchange of information between treatment centers and contributes to research so that other uh, centers can share what is working well and how different cancers are being treated effectively. So there are several different ways to classify cancer. Uh, one is the American Joint Committee on Cancer Classification. Uh, this is what evaluates the level of cellular change in the tumor compared to the tissue of origin or the tissue where it came from. Um, so you'll see different grades of tumor or tissue from G1 or grade one all the way through grade four. Low grades, which are grade one and grade two, are maybe also called well-differentiated tumors. So these are tumors where the cells differ the least from normal cells. So a low-grade breast cancer tumor may look more similar to normal breast cells. High-grade tumors, grade three or grade four, may also be called poorly differentiated tumors, and they look the most different from normal cells. So if you have a high-grade uh, liver tumor, for example, uh, the cells in that sample will look most different from uh, normal liver cells. So after a tumor is graded through that grading system or that grading scale, Oftentimes, the oncologist will do what is called staging. So this evaluates the extent of disease, and it considers the size of the tumor, the invasion of nearby tissues, if there's any lymph node involvement, and if it's spread anywhere throughout the body. Um, there are several different ways to stage cancer, and it depends on the type of cancer that you have, but we'll go over some of the most common ones. So this clinical staging classification system goes through stages uh, zero through four. So grade zero, I'm sorry, stage zero is cancer in situ, which means that the cancer is in its original place and it has not spread beyond that location. So this might be a very small cancer that is still confined to the breast duct in the breast cancer. Uh, this is typically considered one of the most mild uh, stages of cancer. Stage one, the tumor is limited to the tissue of origin, but there's some localized tumor growth, so it's starting to spread a little, but it's mostly still contained. Stage two has limited local spread, so spreading a little bit further, but still mostly in the main body part where it started. Stage three is extensive local and regional spread, so that's when a cancer moves beyond that organ of origin and maybe extends to the lymph nodes or some nearby structures. And then stage four is metastasis, which means that the cancer has spread to other distant parts of the body. So another way to stage cancer is called the TNM staging system. T stands for the primary tumor size. N stands for the absence or presence of regional lymph node involvement and M stands for the absence or presence of distant metastasis. So this is looking at very similar things as the uh, stage one through four staging system. Um, it's a little bit different and may be uh, preferable from oncologist to oncologist for different types of diagnoses, um, but they're looking at very similar things. So metastasis is the spread of malignant or cancer cells away from the primary tumor. So essentially, cancer that starts in one part of the body has now spread to a totally unrelated other part of the body. Um, there are some common sites of metastasis include the brain, the lungs, the liver, and the bone. And oftentimes, these cancer cells travel throughout our body through the bloodstream or through our lymph nodes. 
Once cancer has been diagnosed and has been classified with either a grade or a stage, and the oncologist has a better understanding of how uh, extensive the cancer disease is, uh, they will start talking about treatment plans. So we will briefly go over some common types of treatments that you may see in cancer. Uh, these will be very dependent on the type of cancer that is being treated, um, and they will also be, um, oftentimes, uh, a provider will choose to use more than one type of treatment. Um, so surgery is a performing a, a procedure to oftentimes remove the tumor from the body. This is oftentimes used in cases where a tumor can be easily removed, such as uh, a breast cancer tumor that is pretty well contained um, or a tumor uh, on the leg if it's a sarcoma and it can be, it's not surrounding a lot of other uh, affected tissues. Radiation is a treatment where uh, radiation is given to either a specific part of the body or sometimes the entire body to kill uh, tiny that bits of cancer, and this may be used as a primary treatment, or it may be used in combination with surgery, either before or after to uh, sometimes shrink a large tumor or to kill any um, small bits of remaining cancer that may still be uh, present in the body after another type of treatment. Chemotherapy, biotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy, um, they all work a little bit differently, but they are similar in the sense that they are given oftentimes either oral or IV, and they work on the entire body to kill any presence of cancer. Uh, again, this may be something that is used alone or it may be used in combination with something like surgery or radiation. Hormonal therapies are the use of hormones to treat specific types of cancers that are influenced by our hormones, such as breast or prostate cancers. And then there are also many complementary or alternative therapies that can be used uh, in conjunction with some of these other treatment modalities. So this might be something like acupuncture or massage or music therapy uh, or aromatherapy to oftentimes uh, support the cancer treatments, um, such as surgery or chemo or radiation, um, or help with symptom management. So the goal of treatment may be different depending on the diagnosis or how extensive the cancer is. So ideally, the goal of every treatment would be to cure the cancer, to cure the patient uh, of their cancer with no or minimal chance of recurrence. Um, so to get the cancer uh, removed from the body and have a very low chance of it coming back. Unfortunately, that is not always a feasible goal depending on the type of cancer or how early it was diagnosed. Um, so sometimes the goal of treatment is to control. So the goal is to keep the cancer from progressing or worsening when a total cure is not possible. Uh, this may be used in cases where um, they know that the cancer can't be uh, gotten rid of completely, but uh, it can be, got, it can be um, kind of maintained in a state where a patient can uh, have uh, several months to several years of a good quality of life. Uh, and then there's the goal of palliation. In this, the goal is to promote the patient's comfort and quality of life over the treatment of the cancer itself, even if that means the cancer progresses or worsens. So this uh, often becomes a goal of treatment in cancers that are very aggressive or are diagnosed very late, uh, where we know that the treatments we have will not uh, make the cancer uh, any better. It will, not, it will not cure the cancer, will not even control the cancer very well. And the side effects of the treatment themselves may diminish the patient's quality of life. So the goal becomes to um, manage the patient's quality of life and symptoms um, rather than treating the cancer itself. Um, so all of these goals of treatment are going to be highly dependent on the cancer diagnosis, uh, how well the treatments we have tend to work on that type of cancer, uh, the patient's care that they have available to them, what their wishes are for their life and their treatment. Um, many factors may play into this. So regardless of the diagnosis or the types of treatments, we always want the best possible outcome in cancer treatment. And this is influenced by many different factors. 
Uh, we've talked about a few of them already, um, but some of the patient factors are having patients who are informed and educated in their cancer diagnosis and what treatments are available. Uh, things like financial resources for transport and housing contribute to a, a good outcome of cancer treatment. And having the time to be able to focus on treatment or get to appointments um, is also an important factor. There are institutional factors, such as the uh, availability of staff and their expertise in order to provide care to the patient, and institutions' capacity or ability to effectively diagnose cancer and a risk referral system. So seeing the right person at the right time for a certain cancer diagnosis. There are disease factors, such as being able to diagnose cancer at an earlier stage when the chance of a cure is more likely. And a patient who has no other health issues, such as infection or malnutrition, or if they do have other uh, health issues, having a way to address those so that they don't negatively impact the ability of the cancer treatment to um, hopefully cure the cancer. And then other types of treatment factors include the ability, availability of appropriate treatments. So the patient having access to the right treatment for their kind of cancer, having access to clinical trials, and having other supportive care services, such as access to a physical therapist if needed, or a dietitian or social work services. Um, so there are many, many factors that influence the best possible outcome in cancer treatment that ultimately lead to better survival. So some key takeaways. Cancer is a collection of over 200 malignant diseases. So no two diagnoses of cancer are going to be look exactly the same or be treated exactly the same. Cancer develops from a combination of genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors that cause our cells to behave abnormally. Your doctor may use several types of tests or procedures to diagnose and stage and classify cancer. And cancer treatments might include surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or other complementary therapies, depending on your diagnosis and your treatment goals. For more information, here are some helpful resources. The American Cancer Society, the International Association of Cancer Registries, the National Cancer Institute Comprehensive Cancer Information Site, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and the Cancer Atlas. Thank you.